And this is uh, Old Bent's Fort near La Junta, Colorado. Yet another place I visited, and I had a funny experience. When I walked in that door, this is the original fort. There's a 1976 reproduction standing in its place. But when I walked in that door, there was a man standing there dressed like a mountain man. And the first thing I said to him, I said, you look exactly like Kit Carson. And he said, that's funny. He's my great-great-great-grandfather. So I thought that was an interesting coincidence. He works at the fort, and he looks exactly like that picture I showed you. Now, the buffalo's uh, turn towards near extinction sped up rapidly during the 1860s with the coming of the Transcontinental Railroad. The most immediate impact of the railroad came during construction. The men who laid the tracks needed to eat, and buffalo meat was a particularly good source of protein. So the railroad companies hired professional hunters, the most famous of which was William F. Cody, who earned his moniker, Buffalo Bill, in the employ of the Union Pacific. In a single year, he killed 4,280 buffalo. Now, the number of buffalo killed to feed construction workers pales in comparison to the number that would be killed uh, by those who would ride the rails, rails west for pleasure and profit. During the early 1870s, shooting buffalo from the comfortable cabins of passing trains and leaving the carcasses to rot on the plains became a gruesome fad that was advertised in Eastern newspapers as a wonderful way to experience the West. And along with the so-called tourists, the rails also brought professional or market hunters, many of whom came just for the tongues in the buffalo's mouths, which were cut out salted and put into barrels and sent east and sold at high-priced restaurants. But most of these hunters came for the robes or the hides themselves, which were tanned and turned into pliable leather belts that turned the wheels of industry. Now, the scope of the slaughter was absolutely staggering. This is a picture from Dodge City, Kansas in 1874. And according to the notes on this image, there are about 250,000 buffalo robes in the image extending out towards the horizon. Between 1872 and 1874, 3.7 million buffalo were killed, and 85% of that number were killed by market hunters. In 1889, there were only 1,091 buffalo left in all of North America, simply an unfathomable number given that at one time maybe 30 million roamed the continent. This cartoon, which was done by Thomas Nast and appeared in the 1874 issue of Harper's Weekly, it's called The Last Buffalo. It says, don't shoot, my good fellow. Here, take my robe, save your ammunition, and let me go in peace. You might know Thomas Nast's name. He's a famous political cartoonist. And he's probably most famous nowadays for being the first person to give us the caricature of what we think of as St. Nick or Santa Claus but this was a decidedly sadder topic. This is The Last Buffalo, a painting by Albert Bierstadt. The near extinction of the buffalo was not only a tragedy for the animal world, but also for the Indians, whose lives depended on it financially, economically, subsistence-wise, and even existentially. And as the number of buffalo dwindled, so too did the ability of the Indians to withstand the onslaught of the white man and their efforts to take away the Indians' lands, way of life, and their independence. Now, the fur trade didn't come to a close with the near extinction of the buffalo. In fact, it hasn't ended at all. Uh, throughout the 20th century and up to the present, people have continued to pursue fur-bearing animals for their pelts. Today, there are roughly 150,000 mostly part-time fur trappers in the United States and about 300 fur farms. And they all contribute to an international fur trade that generates profits of between 10 and $15 billion. But this is not the topic of my book, because my book ends with the rise of the conservation movement around 1900. It turns out that the plight of the buffalo was a symptom of a much larger problem facing American society. The 1800s, especially the latter half, has been termed the age of extermination, and for good reason. Huge numbers of animals were killed for a variety of reasons, uh, 
Some, like the buffalo, were driven nearly to extinction, and a few, such as the passenger pigeon, were driven off the face of the earth. And a number of individuals and organizations started speaking out against this slaughter. The two most famous individuals were President Theodore Roosevelt and John Muir, shown here in Yosemite in 1903. And their efforts and the efforts of these organizations they represented helped lead to the rise of the conservation movement. And that, in turn, had a major impact on the operation of the fur trade. No longer would it be get the furs while they last. For the first time, there were an increasing number of state, federal, and even international laws that restricted the number of fur-bearing animals that could be taken. And it's at this transition point that my story leaves off and another one begins, but one that'll have to be written by somebody else, because I'm already working on my next book, which is on the American trade with China from the American Revolution through the end of the Civil War. So with that, I'm done with my talk, and I'd be happy to answer any questions you have, and I'm, thank you for, for coming.
And since we're in Patriots territory, even though I'm not a big football fan, a guy, Danny Woodhead, which he's just an amazing player, and I really like him because he's only a little bit bigger than I am, uh, he came from Shadron State. So he's sort of putting Shadron on the map, so maybe more Patriot fans will end up going to Shadron, Nebraska, and they'll stop at the Museum of the Fur Trade, which is really an amazing, amazing place. Okay, uh, yes. Um, can you talk a little bit, I, I, reading about your book, somewhere it said that the, they saw the first beaver in, was it New York? Or? Oh yeah, 2007, <laughs> they saw a beaver in the Bronx River. It was the first one seen in New York for two hundred years, and they named it Jose. <laughs> well, the reason they named Jose is because there was a congressman named Jose Serrano who provided a lot of the funds that have been used to clean up the Bronx River, so it was sort of a thank you to him. And from what I understand, Jose has been seen in years since, and I guess as Frank Sinatra says, if you can make it there, you can make it anywhere. <laughs> Beaver are, are very good at reproducing and repopulating areas. Uh, my next book actually got sparked by something in this book, reading about the sea otter trade. I didn't know a lot about the sea otter trade. And since China is always in the news today, often with alarming uh, notices of how we're soon going to be all working for the Chinese or, and there are culture clashes, I thought, wouldn't it be interesting to look at when America and China first met? So I'm doing a book on the China trade from the close of the American Revolution up through the Civil War. So I'm going to look at the trade in tea, silk, porcelain, nankeens, uh, cloth and stuff, lacquerware, the opium wars, the expansion of the American merchant fleet, uh, the Forbeses, the, I don't know if Peabody's were involved, I think they might have been, but uh, it's just, it's, it's this great sprawling story about how America got up off the ground after the American Revolution and started trading with the world and the way they announced themselves to the world was largely through the China trade initially. And it's just a fascinating story full of pirates, shipwrecks, gold, silver, deceit, great fortunes, drugs, slavery. It's got everything in it. It's a, it's a great story. And I just want to say one other thing because I, I, you know, I've, I've given this talk a lot. Hopefully it didn't sound like I'd given it too many times. It is tough after. I can't imagine how Broadway actors do the same play 200 times. I have a cousin who acts on Broadway. But this is about my 60th time of giving this talk or a variation of the talk. And I noticed at the end of the talk, a lot of people are sort of depressed because I talk a lot about killing animals. But I want to assure you, let me see if I can find you. I want to assure you that it's not really that depressing of a book. And I'm no, you know, I didn't write it because I'm, I'm kind of a pacifist. I'm not, I'm not a, Tom Ashbrook of On Point and uh, WBUR asked me, after he interviewed me for Leviathan in this book, and he asked me off camera, he goes, do you like killing animals? Because he used to be a fur trapper. And he goes, because you're writing about all these, these grisly uh, trades. And I said, no, I just, I love the stories. I think it's fascinating stories. And I still do. Oh, oh yeah, I wanted, to, I wanted to read you a sentence from one of the reviews. So you don't have to take it from me. This is from Audubon magazine. Uh, it says, uh, Fur Fortune and Empire is no melancholy affair. The book bursts with colorful characters, venal corporations, and violent confrontations, all presented with a sharp-eyed clarity in a narrative that clips right along. But I promised my wife and my kids, I, I work in the basement, they call it the cave, it's not a man cave. I don't have a TV down there. Oh, there is a TV down there, but it's an old one. I don't use it. And I have a little bit of light, and I've got thousands of books all over the place. And, but I promised my family that after the China Trade book, I'm going to try to write a book that's all about goodness and light and makes everybody happy. <laughs> Maybe history of the teddy bear or something. <laughs> <laughs> because it's funny that I write about these somewhat controversial topics, because although I have strong political beliefs, I'm kind of an apolitical person. I lived in D.C. for seven years worked for a senator there, and I'm so cynical about politics, 